I V M. When the Good Food Institute US officially began operations on February 1st, 2016, the global food system looked markedly different than it does today. The team had been working with Memphis Meats for some months on crafting a strategy to debut their meat cultivated directly from cells to the world. Meanwhile, Beyond Meat had been generating some buzz for their early plant-based meat substitutes. Impossible Foods was a few months away from launching its own plant-based beef burger. and just was still a year away from debuting its signature moon bean based eggs cut to 2020 and the alternative protein sector is proving to be a lift for the entire food industry the cultivated meat sector which was five companies at the end of 2016 is now nearly 60 memphis meats that first company in the space recently announced a mammoth 186 million dollar raise to scale up production and begin commercialization of meat cultivated by farming cells directly instead of inefficiently raising and slaughtering animals the modern plant based meat sector on the other hand which was basically just two flagship companies then is now hundreds of companies all over the world billions of dollars have flowed into plant based meat eggs and dairy at ever accelerating rates perhaps most encouragingly governments all over the world including singapore israel canada and the eu are now committing serious funding to research and innovation to the smart protein sector and making it a central piece of their food security and climate resilience story GFI has grown to a network of non-profits in the US, Brazil, India, Israel, Greater China, Singapore, the EU and the UK during that time and been central to building the sector through scientific work, grant making, regulatory advisory, investor education, corporate engagement and pretty much everything that can accelerate the future of protein today to kick off season 2 of feeding 10 billion we're joined by the person who laid the groundwork for all of this impact bruce friedrich is executive director at the good food institute in the us he's a ted fellow and a public speaker on food innovation in fact we recorded this podcast when he was in india as a speaker for the tedx gateway event in february bruce has spent op-eds for publications including the Wall Street Journal and Wired and appeared on the Today Show, NBC Nightly News, CBS Evening News and a variety of programs on Fox News, CNN, MSNBC, etc. He's also the author of two books including Clean Protein with Kathy Freston as well as several book chapters and law review articles. Bruce holds degrees from Georgetown Law, the London School of Economics and Johns Hopkins University and lives in Washington DC. I'm Varun Deshpande Managing Director at the Good Food Institute India and I'm Ramya Ramurthy the Communications Specialist at the Good Food Institute India and you're listening to Feeding 10 Billion. So Bruce, welcome to our podcast. Thank you. I'm delighted to be here, Ramya. And could we start off by uh, having you share a bit about your personal arc from someone who ran a soup kitchen taught in impoverished inner city schools and then did a bit of animal activism and some policy? to now setting up GFI or Good Food Institute which is building an ecosystem of alternative protein in the world. Yeah, sure. Um so I read a book called Diet for a Small Planet by Francis Morlepe and in Diet for a Small Planet Lepe basically argues that growing massive amounts of crops to feed them to farm animals so that we can eat farm animals in the global economy that we currently exist in it drives up the price of crops and causes people to starve and That was the thing that caused me to adopt a vegan diet back in 1987, but veganism wasn't my you know, primary focus. I was particularly interested in what I personally could do to alleviate global poverty and to help poor people and it seemed like a pretty natural thing to run a soup kitchen and run a uh, homeless shelter, which I did for a little over 6 years in inner city Washington DC. I discovered what is just a colossally broken educational system in the United States and I uh, decided through a program in the US called Teach for America uh to teach in the inner city for a couple of years. Yeah, we have a similar thing called Teach for India as well now. So how does that arc evolve? For instance, people may call you a hardliner when it comes to animal activism. How do you evolve from that to something that is more positive towards industry cooperation in growing the alternative protein sector? 
Yeah, I'm not sure that the hardliner description really fits. So, I mean, I think PETA gets a reputation as being hardline because PETA does a lot of things that are fairly uncompromising, mostly with the intention of getting people's attention. But uh, even at PETA, like we worked with McDonald's, we worked with Burger King, we worked with Safeway, and we didn't require that they, you know, go vegan or stop selling meat. We really did take concessions that were incremental improvements in animal welfare. And if something was going to make hundreds of millions of hens' lives less bad every single year, so, you know, you get at billions in four years, that was something that we would celebrate, laud the company for, and move on to try to parlay that win into wins with other companies. So we really, I mean, even, even then, we're happy to work with companies to make things incrementally less bad. Uh, but at the same time, you know, the animal rights is sort of a movement, just like civil rights or feminism or GLBTQ. And there are things that are right and there are things that are wrong. And you take concessions to make things better. But at the end of the day, you have sort of your baseline. And uh, that was certainly true at PETA. But it, it really was a, a pretty utilitarian organization and is a utilitarian organization. And the Good Food Institute is a utilitarian organization. So we're basically have sort of rethought what it will take to actually transform animal agriculture. And clearly, uh, the trajectory of meat consumption is, you know, angled up. We're expected to need to produce 50 to 100% more meat by 2050 on our current trajectory. And any sort of theory of change and any action plan needs to be able to address meat consumption literally everywhere. And plant-based and cultivated meat does that, and it does that most effectively if there's not some sort of ethical shaming component to it. At this, the outset of season two of Feeding 10 Billion, let's take the opportunity with you, Bruce, to dig in a little bit more to why it is that we're working on factory farming in the first place, right? As a sort of deep dive, a reset into what our motivations are at the Good Food Institute and with Feeding 10 Billion. So can you talk a little bit about your personal motivations and how those things dovetail with each other? So is it the spreadsheet of the number of animals that are being used in factory farming, the immense environmental implications of animal agriculture? Is it the food security aspect? You mentioned that you started out focused on global poverty and global food security. So which of these things takes primacy for you personally? Um, I mean, for me, it's uh, it's very exciting to be going back to my original reason for getting involved in food and getting interested in food. I actually, my undergraduate degree, my focus was agricultural economics. So it's an economics degree, but I focused on agricultural economics and I focused on structural adjustment programs. And Diet for a Small Planet doesn't talk about animal concerns at all. My original reason for getting involved in food and being concerned about the waste of the meat industry was primarily the resource use. It was primarily food security and global poverty because what happens now is the majority of everything that's grown, the majority of crops, that majority is fed to farm animals because farm animals are extraordinarily inefficient at turning crops into meat. It takes nine calories into a chicken to get one calorie back out. And people are very incensed about food waste, and we should be incensed about food waste. But if food waste is like 40% of everything that's grown in developed economies, there is an inherent waste in animal agriculture, an inherent waste in the physiology of farm animals, where the most efficient animal, you're talking about 800% food waste, eight out of nine calories fed to a chicken. The chicken expends simply existing or it goes into something that we're not able to eat. So the two big questions in food are, how do we feed close to 10 billion people by 2050? And what do we do about climate change? And I think those are two of the fundamental reasons that we need to innovate in meat in particular, because meat is particularly inefficient and it is a particularly bad impact on climate. And then the third thing that we talk about a lot at, at GFI is antibiotic resistance, because we're feeding about 70% of all antibiotics produced globally, we're feeding to farm animals, which is a global health emergency. The former head of the World Health Organization is actually saying we're talking about the end of modern medicine. And then the fourth thing is animals. And I guess one of the things that's, uh, you know, sort of, um, I don't know if it's terrifying or exciting or what, but each of these is independently just an overwhelmingly strong reason to be working on reforming meat. And I'm not sure which one is, is most important for me, but, uh, you know, food security and global poverty, global health and antibiotic resistance, climate change and the host of environmental reasons, and then just vast animal cruelty involved in the way that we raise farm animals today. Like you said, each and every one of those things is a rabbit hole in terms of how much we could dive into it right now and over the course of this season of Feeding 10 Billion. For me, this also goes into what talented people want to spend their lives working on. 
and what they feel resonance with in terms of their life's direction. So for me personally, I got into this from the global health side through a movement called effective altruism, right? And for me, the idea was not only is this a huge area of work, is it a huge problem? It is also quite neglected in terms of the amount of, and we're going to talk about this further in this episode, but in terms of the resources that are going into this problem relative to its scale, it's hugely neglected. And then lastly, what's really exciting is this is a solvable problem. This is a tractable problem during our lifetime. When GFI started in late 2015, when you were putting the team together, perhaps it wasn't clear how rapidly this would evolve. Even when I joined to start the India team at the end of 2017, it wasn't really clear how quickly it would evolve. I don't think we predicted that 2019 was going to be such a massive, absolute gangbusters year globally, especially in the United States, right? But what we're seeing right now is we're able to attract talent into this sector and to the Good Food Institute for all of the reasons that you described. I would say that perhaps most of our talent comes in from a sustainability standpoint, but we're increasingly getting people who see the reasons that you're describing, right? Because African swine fever is decimating the pig population right now in China because of the indiscriminate use of antibiotics on these farms, right? Even the novel coronavirus 2019 has emerged from animal consumption, albeit wild animal consumption in animal markets. So all of these things are clear, visceral examples of why people need to get involved now uh, and focus on developing expertise and deploying it to this really, really massive cause area, which is fascinating. Yeah. And just to sort of, uh, as a follow-up question, could you outline why you think this is the solution for the sector or one of the most important solutions for the sector in terms of all the problems you outlined? Because a lot of people have this sort of return to a pastoral past where we you know, farmed animals more compassionately. We grew crops more ethically and organically. We were uh, more sustainable in terms of biodiversity or protecting the planet or the soil. Why do you think this is the problem that deserves all of your attention versus any of the other things I outlined? Well, I mean, not, not to discount the value of the slow food movement and everything else that you're talking about, but if we're going to have a solution that actually solves the problem, it needs to work globally. And I would suggest that the slow food, organic, whole foods movement has certainly influenced some people, but it has not turned the tide in the United States or in India or really anywhere else. So even in the places where there are dozens or more organizations that are focused on exactly what you just described, we're seeing meat consumption, industrial animal consumption go up. I mean, even per capita industrial animal production in Europe and North America is high as it has ever been, despite the fact that there are dozens of these organizations, many very strong voices in Europe and North America who are sort of singing that clarion call, and it just hasn't worked. So then you start thinking about China and India and the rest of the world where meat consumption is going up particularly quickly and agriculture is consolidating particularly quickly. And it just seems like if those things can't work with the amount of resources that they have gotten so far in the areas where they are sort of uh, most well-developed, how likely are they to provide a global solution? And I would suggest not that likely. So I have not heard anyone present a tenable case for an alternative theory of change to GFI's theory of change. And that's just we need to make the products that people want to buy, but do it without all of the external costs, without the harm to the environment, to the global poor, to animals, and to global health. And it it just seems like that's literally the only game in town from anybody who's not just sort of screaming no Uh, closing their eyes, closing their ears, and just, you know, hoping that we get different results doing the exact same thing. Yeah, that's the definition of insanity, where you do the same thing and expect different results. Um, So what, according to Bruce Friedrich, are the three most important things that have happened in this sector? Um, In terms of the three most exciting things, I mean, I guess I would nod back at what Varun said a second ago. 2019 was just so off the hook. And figuring out the three most important things, I think, is going to be very difficult. So GFI operates in three areas, policy, corporate engagement, and science and technology. So I'll just pick one from each. From the policy vantage, I think the meat industry getting on board with cultivated meat has been pretty exciting. So even in the United States, the American Meat Institute and Memphis Meats signing a letter to the USDA and the FDA expressing support for the idea of a memorandum of understanding and joint regulatory oversight. Regulatory oversight and whether governments allow cultivated meat to be sold um, is pretty much existential for the technology. So having the meat industry see this as opportunity and not threat has been pretty massive. 
But on the corporate engagement side, seeing companies like JBS, the largest meat company in the world, Tyson, the second largest meat company in the world, both launch their own plant-based lines has been pretty exciting. And then seeing Tyson and Cargill, which is the third largest meat company in the world, um, investing in cultivated meat companies is really just extraordinarily huge. And then in science and technology, I think governments funding open source science and technology research with India leading the way is probably the most exciting thing that uh, has happened in the science and technology front. Yeah, and actually, so that's really exciting, right? So just a quick recap. So towards the end of 2018, I had co-presented along with the Center for Cellular and Molecular Biology, a proposal to the Government of India Department of Biotechnology to cultivate sheep meat, mutton from sheep cells. And that was really exciting because uh, it was, I think, the first time that the that the Department of Biotechnology had seen something like this. And they ended up giving a grant of about rupees 4.6 crores or $640,000 to this project. We're actually at a pretty interesting point with that project. And I think there's going to be some news leading on from it pretty soon in terms of uh, the organization is ready to see how they can take that research and bring it to market through some commercial relationships, which is really exciting. Bruce, you already mentioned some of this, but... My next question to you is, what are you seeing as the biggest drivers of what can dictate the success or failure of our industry moving forward? The biggest drivers for success and failure, I mean, the biggest driver for success would be governments recognizing that plant-based and cultivated meat fit into their current theory of change and fit into their current funding model. So governments put billions of dollars into making agriculture more efficient and also into incentives for agricultural industries. Governments put tens of billions of dollars into renewable energy, both to lift up those entire sectors and uh, because of the threat of climate change and other environmental harms. Governments put about a $100 billion a year into health, open source, R&D, again, both to help the those various industries in healthcare and then also because that will help global health and to treat diseases and antibiotics research and that sort of thing. So governments recognizing that plant-based and cultivated meat is the solution to problems that governments recognize that they have. So most governments care about climate change and have signed on to the Paris Climate Agreement. We're not going to meet our obligations under Paris unless meat consumption goes down. And the only way to do that, I mean, meat consumption is not going to go down, uh, but we can switch to plant-based meat and cultivated meat. And if governments recognize that, they could put some of their R&D money into open source plant-based and cultivated meat. Um, And then a similar story on the global health front, as well as the food security front, and then governments that care particularly about water scarcity and other issues, putting money into their university systems for open source science on plant-based and cultivated meat. I think is the biggest opportunity, and that's the thing that would really make plant-based meat and cultivated meat happen um, a lot more quickly than under any other scenario. Yeah, you mentioned that governments are putting in a ton of money into renewable energy, for example. And if the analogy that many people draw is if clean energy is getting so much money, so should clean meat, right? Plant-based and cultivated meat. But what's really interesting is if you add in the number for how much money industry spends on renewable energy, you get a massive amount of spending per year. So in a banner year 2011, even last year, which wasn't uh, an extremely high year, I think it was at or close to the record for renewable energy, it gets close to $400 billion of investment every year globally, right? And if you look at the plant-based and cultivated meat ecosystem, it gets something like a billion dollars a year, right? And that's at its I think absolute, quite a bit less than that. At its absolute peak, including in investment from industry and from government. Right? Okay. And the government number is a minuscule portion of that. That's the issue. Right. There's an additional number that we aren't actually talking about as much. If you look at total philanthropy into these sectors, um, it's tiny, right? So it's something on the order of $10 million, which is so small as to be negligible, right? So Could you build a case, for example, about the value of philanthropy for a high net worth individual looking at creating an impact in the world in our sector versus just investing in the technology and trying to develop something themselves? Yeah, I mean, if somebody invests, you're investing in the individuals who run that company and the individuals may be phenomenal and they may not be phenomenal, but it's just, it's really tough to know for sure. Lots and lots of companies fail for a wide variety of reasons. Additionally, if you're investing, you're paying for rents, you're paying for lawyers, you're paying for business setup fees. Some percentage of the money that you invest 
actually goes into research and development. And 100% of that goes into research and development that is going to be protected by intellectual property laws. That's a part of the value proposition of the company is that they don't share their science. So it's a good thing to do, relatively speaking, I suppose. Although we are now in a place where all of the plant-based and cultivated meat companies that are worth funding basically have oversubscribed rounds. So money that you want to invest in one of these companies, if you don't do it, the counterfactual is that somebody else will invest that money. So you might feel that your money is a little bit more pure, but it's not the but for cause of really anything at all in the world, unless you are a particularly active investor and are particularly good as a mentor and particularly good as an advisor. And I don't want to discount that. That certainly has some value. But If you use your money philanthropically through the Good Food Institute in particular, we will use your money to push forward across policy, across corporate engagement, across science and technology. And people who have a particularly large amount of money and would like to actually sponsor open source research, you have the capacity to create R&D that is available to all of the companies. And we actually do work with the companies to figure out what it is that would be maximally helpful to all of them. We also figure out what the white spaces are, then go about filling those white spaces in a way that lifts up the entire sector. So I do think that philanthropically, your money is the but for cause of lots of awesome things happening. But if you invest the money, it's probably not the but for cause of really anything happening. And then GFI will help the entire sector and otherwise you're helping one particular company. I mean, a really good illustration of this, I think, was The New Yorker, maybe uh, three or four months ago, did a piece about predominantly about Impossible Foods. And they mentioned that Impossible Foods is funding research in their labs to get the off flavors out of pea protein. And they also mentioned almost in passing that Beyond Meat is doing the exact same research. And so is GFI, but GFI is going to share that research with the world, whereas whatever Beyond Meat and Impossible Foods figure out, they'll only be using it for their, you know, for their own uh, scientists and for their own products. Yeah, it's it's important to note. I mean, so we, we've had guests in the previous season where we talked about really interesting questions like um, the fundamental foundations of flavor, right? So what does it mean to be salmon versus bluefin tuna versus cod versus pomfret versus bangda? All of these various fish from a texture and a flavor standpoint, nobody knows. So it's impossible for me as an entrepreneur today to say, I want to make this fish, this kind of plant-based fish. And this is exactly how I'm going to do it. A lot of these folks have to do fundamental research first, which uses literally in some cases, dozens of millions of dollars. Um, And they're all doing it in silos inside their companies, right? So I think it makes a lot of sense to, if you are indeed impact focused, if that's your first lens as a high net worth individual, to consider um, the value of philanthropy, either in terms of research grant programs or various other areas, as opposed to just directly investing in a company. I think that those opportunities will always be open as well. On that note, we're going to go ahead and take a break on this, the first episode of season two of Feeding 10 Billion. Hello, everybody. Welcome to another week on the IVM Podcast Network. If you're not following us on social media, please do. We're IVM Podcast on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. I'd like to thank our sponsors this week, Paytm Money and Intel. We appreciate their support. It's been a fantastic week on the IVM Network. I hope that you've been checking stuff out, but some of the highlights that you definitely should check out. Ashish Vidyarthi, host of Begin the Journey, was on Cyrus Says. They had a really fun conversation. I think you'll enjoy that. Uncle Please Sid did an episode around development, which was really, really fun. On Edges and Sledges, we had Adam Holio former England captain. While wow, those guys are killing it one cricketer after the other. Definitely do check out Advertising is Dead. We talk about esports with some really guys who really know that space. Smile India, absolutely right. These guys are killing it as well. So is Pawan at Pragati. Don't forget the original things. Again, one of my favorite shows. You must, must, must check that out. It's just been a really fun week, folks. I hope that you enjoy it. And with that, let's get you back to your show. Welcome back. You're listening to Feeding 10 Billion. Bruce, you witnessed and been instrumental at GFI in ensuring some phenomenal firsts, highs like the public listing of a multi-billion dollar company, uh, a plant-based meat company that we call Beyond Meat. The funding news of SoftBank, Norwest and Temasek investing $161 million recently into uh, Memphis Meats in their Series B round. Uh, and you mentioned them 
earlier as well. They're making meat from cells. And also the massive success of impossible foods and QSR formats like Burger King and now, you know, KFC is debuting a plant-based chicken with Beyond Meat. But there's been some pushback as well, expectedly. The industry, especially from the cattle and milk industries, have, you know, in a move you called Orwellian, said you can't use the words meat or milk to define what you're doing with these new plant-based foods. That's what's happened in the West. In India, how do you think it's going to play out in terms of general pathways to great products? Is it going to be entrepreneurs demonstrating market pull and getting the big corporations involved? Or will they have to invest their heft and capital first to create successful products here? I want to back up to the premise and just say that uh, at GFI, we are obviously huge fans of Beyond Meat and Impossible Foods and Memphis Meats. And we do work with all of those companies, I think, internationally and have been working with them for our entire existence. But um, it was obviously uh, Ethan Brown and his team at Beyond Meat that were responsible for the IPO success and Uma and his team at Memphis that secured their incredibly exciting Series B. So GFI, hopefully we've been creating uh, an ecosystem and an environment in which those things are more likely to happen. But obviously all kudos to the companies uh, that actually made those things happen. In terms of India, it's, it's sort of a, it's tough to know for sure. feels a little odd for you, Ramya, to be asking me <laughs> that question. Um, I would think that you and Varun would have a, a much better sense of what that's going to look like than I would. We want to know if you've take got the Take a stab right. at it. <laughs> You're the guest. Take a stab at it. Let's, uh, let's, let's see if I've got it figured out. I'll, I'll, I'll uh, answer and then you can grade me and tell me how wrong I am and why. Yeah, in a couple of years, we can point back at this episode and say, wow, Bruce Friedrich really didn't know what he was talking about. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but uh, it only it only works if you correct me. So, um, I, I mean, I, you know, it's it's really I think tough to know both in the United States and in India what is going to be the trigger. Oftentimes, there are specific individuals that just make it their passion, and they are going to make something happen. And those individuals can be innovators, and those individuals can be people inside of corporations. So. In the United States, we found both innovators who are doing just spectacular things and literally are the, the but for cause of a lot of the advancements that are happening in innovation in the United States. And then we've met people at these massive global conglomerates who make it their mission inside of their corporations to really push forward alternative proteins. And there obviously has to be sympathy for the concept at the top, but oftentimes that sympathy, I mean, it, it comes with the amount of attention and discussion that is happening in society comes with the amount of attention and discussion that's happening inside of the corporation. It does require visionary leadership to some degree. And we have just been thrilled in the United States to see the degree to which the conventional food industry and the conventional meat industry really sees these technologies as opportunity, not threat. So then the question is, what does that look like in India? Do the food corporations see this as opportunity, I would guess in a culture as sympathetic to vegetarianism as India is, they would see it as opportunity. Uh, but then you've also got a country that is as diverse as India is and the value proposition for alternative proteins in a country that eats in such a different and varied way from you know north to south and east to west. It's just, I think that the United States is significantly more homogenous in terms of eating trends than India is. Um, and it just seems like the distribution channels in India are going to be more difficult to crack. And whether that makes innovation more likely to succeed or corporations taking these ideas seriously more likely to succeed. I mean, I would, I would have to guess corporations, but that's also a tougher row to hoe. I think that's certainly what it has uh, felt like to us in the United States. And I'd be surprised if there's some reason that that doesn't transfer to India. Yeah, I think, I mean, I think those things happen in parallel with each other. So to give you an example of how something has evolved in a country that's perhaps more like India than the United States is, uh, Brazil. So our counterparts in Brazil worked with an entrepreneur named Marcos Lecha over the last couple of years. He has a background in, in, in food, right? So his family owns a distribution chain of grocery. So he understands how business works. He understands sort of how packaged foods works. And he goes to the US. He visits a lot of these companies along with our colleagues in the US. Just Beyond Meat gets really inspired, goes back to Brazil, realizes that he can't simply import those products because the, the import regime in Brazil, exactly like India, would price these products out of the market. Very few people would even be able to afford them if he just imported them. It's not really making the change he wants to make. 
So Marcos and our GFI Brazil team work together to create their own burger product, right? It's called the Futuro Burger and the name of the company is Fazenda Futuro. They launch in the Brazilian market within six to eight months, they've captured 23% of all burgers sold in the country across the top three grocery chains in Brazil. That's an example of what can happen really quickly at the entrepreneurial level. And then really quickly, it actually pulls in the largest companies in Brazil, which is hugely exciting. So JBS, the largest meat company in the world, ADM, one of the largest agri-food companies in the world, Marfrig, one of the largest meat companies in Brazil and in the world, they come together and they start releasing their own products as well. So this is an, an indication of what's possible and everything sort of needs to happen together. Now, we don't know whether those companies were developing something in-house, you know, whether the Fazenda Futuro burger was the kind of push that these other companies needed to really get involved in a big way. But um, yeah, as Bruce said, I think it's really hard to predict exactly what's going to happen first. But we have to kind of keep plugging away in all of these areas. And maybe, you know, maybe one of the innovators is going to be listening to Feeding 10 Billion on IVM podcast right now. So if you want to work in this area, please get in touch. And it may also be that somebody in one of these cor- one of the big uh, food corporations is listening right now or somebody in government is listening right now. There's a, an awful lot of opportunity for everyone. Maybe this podcast will actually start a sort of innovation war between companies and entrepreneurs. Who knows? You know, we're all working towards all protein being the new normal. Could you give us a very sort of simple to understand, easy to understand, paint a picture for us what this would constitute for you, starting with the West, I guess? I think the thing that makes alt protein the new normal, the sort of holy grail, is it has to taste the same or better, and it has to cost the same or less. So literally every consumer research survey, and I don't know why they keep doing them because they just keep getting the same results, but the things that dictate consumer choice, is it delicious? Is it reasonably priced? And then oftentimes they don't measure for this, but it's sort of a given. It has to be convenient. You have to be able to find it somewhere. And I think alt protein stays niche for as long as consumers don't like it, at least as much, and or as long as it is more expensive. But once you have plant-based products that taste the same or better that consumers really like and that cost the same or less, that's when you move toward the idea of alternative proteins being the new normal. And that's going to take a little time. I mean, Beyond Meat, it took them from 2009 to 2016 to get their signature product, the Beyond Burger. And Ethan Brown, you know, on their quarterly call, um, a couple of quarterly calls ago, said he thinks that they're about 90% of the way there in terms of taste the same or better. um, And that they're at least a few years off from cost the same or less. And that's just one product. And burgers are significantly more expensive than than chickens and pork. So we have some innovating to do. Impossible Foods, I think they probably are there in terms of taste the same or better. But that's one product. The pork products are also super exciting and, and moving in the right direction. But chicken, you know, that's the number one meat globally. And it's also just insanely inexpensive. So this is an area where we need to see a lot more innovation. But I'm super enthusiastic about our prospects for getting there. One thing that's super exciting about Beyond Meat success is in 2019, in the United States, yellow peas for pea protein, which is the bulk protein ingredient inside the Beyond Burger, was grown on something like 1.1 million acres of land across seven states. That was up 28% from the year prior. So an entire value chain and all the benefit that's giving to farmers is being created by one company, right? So you can imagine as this sector continues to grow, and that is a technological problem, that's an investment problem. As it continues to grow, you'll see a lot more benefits percolating into society, which in turn will feed back into the ecosystem and allow that to become even cheaper. And that's really what's needed at that scale. And that's kind of why we were talking earlier about entrepreneurs as well as large corporations. You do need the large corporations to get involved, create reliable supply of ingredients, etc. Speaking of technology, why do we need different types of technologies involved? Why do we need plant-based meat? Why do we need fermentation technologies? Why do we need cultivated meat? Why isn't there just one winner? Yeah, I do want to back up just a minute though and underline um, what you were saying about pea protein because pea protein was almost an accident as sort of the next big thing. So plant-based meat forever has been either soy or wheat. um, And it has been a byproduct of, in the case of soy, soy oil. And in the case of wheat, the wheat carbohydrates for things like bread and noodles. And there was this, all of this sort of protein and what do we do with it? And it's, let's cram it together and force vegetarians to eat it. 
And mm-hmm. that's basically how veggie burgers and veggie nuggets came to be. And again, they didn't have to taste very good because vegetarians were like happy to eat whatever. And, you know, they're sort of comfort food. It's what it looks like what we used to eat if we used to eat meat. And then some research at the University of Missouri into pea protein optimization, Ethan Brown saw it and he commercialized it. He turned it into Beyond Meat with their original products, which were a Beyond Meat chicken strip and something called the Beast Burger. And and they were pretty good. They were better than the products that had come along up until that point, although Ethan says he's embarrassed by them now and he's actually pulled the chicken strips and now has at KFC a whole new product that I have not yet tried, but I hear is fantastic. But there's no reason it couldn't be lupin or lentils or chickpeas. There's no reason it couldn't be a range of other protein products. And and India in particular produces more legumes than any other country in the world. So uh, India really is in a phenomenal position to take advantage of both the plant-based and the cultivated meat side of alt proteins, where manufacturing is extraordinarily affordable, where India is already producing more legumes than any place else in the world where universities are absolutely excellent and you have just terrific scientific minds at research institutes all over the country. Uh, So India is is in a pretty good place to, to take advantage of this. And one other thing that this underlines is the degree to which there is just tremendous room for additional scientific innovation. People oftentimes see cultivated meat, like plant-based meat, we're kind of there, and cultivated meat is where we need innovation. And that's just fundamentally and absolutely maybe the opposite of what's so. With cultivated meat, we're just taking tissue engineering and applying them to food and scaling them up. And I don't want to discount how hard that is. Um, It's extraordinarily hard. But when GFI started in 2015, 2016, we assumed the sort of conventional wisdom that cultivated meat would be the really hard one and plant-based meat would be relatively easy. And nothing about what we thought to be true scientifically where cultivated meat is concerned has changed. The critical technology elements are still the exact same critical technology elements. We didn't get any surprises when we laid out the technological readiness assessment for cultivated meat. Plant-based meat has been sort of revelation after revelation after revelation, maybe in part because people have been eating veggie burgers for so long. And so the innovation opportunities were sort of more hidden. But there is just phenomenal and tremendous opportunity to innovate from crop optimization to manufacturing. Most of these companies are still using manufacturing methods from 50 years ago to scale up, to distribution, to kind of everything. And just to underline what you're saying, when we're talking about technologies, they're not necessarily competing with each other because we're talking about food, which is incredibly personal and subjective. And I want something different in the morning than I want in the afternoon, usually, right? That's kind of how it works. So the the opportunity here with these different technologies to create an explosion of flavor and different types of meats for people that they can eat across the day and different people within the same family can eat something that they want uh, is massive. What is happening in cultivated meat and in plant-based meat now is we're starting to see kind of what happened at the beginning of the, let's say, the mobile phone revolution or even the personal computing revolution, where you're starting to see vendors come in to supply each of those technology elements. So imagine now today, if we still only had to source phones from companies that were making every single component of that phone from scratch, it would be A, insanely expensive, and B, they wouldn't be able to do half the things that they can do right now. If the same company was manufacturing And innovating in the camera, the chip, the motherboard, all of these things, it would be impossible to have all the crazy innovation we have in phones right now. You can get a smartphone now that has way more capacity than the Apollo 11 space computer, which went to the moon, right? I mean, millions of times more storage, for example, that fits in your pocket and you use it to throw birds at pig houses or whatever, right? And that one went to the moon. And what's happening now in our in our sector is really fascinating because you're seeing people coming in who are saying, okay, I'm going to supply the picks and shovels in this gold rush. I'm going to supply the chips, right? The the cell lines and the the, the cell culture media, et cetera, et cetera. Similarly for plant-based meat with the ingredients you were describing, it doesn't have to be pea protein, it can be lupin, it can be pulses, there's other pulses rather, it can be all sorts of different things, which is fascinating. That also underlines though, I think the degree to which cultivated meat is further along than plant-based meat. There are the people designing the cell lines. There are the people who are doing the media. There are the people who are doing the scaffolding and the bioreactors. That this infrastructure exists across all of the critical technologies for cultivated meats. And it really fundamentally doesn't across plant-based meat. And that I think is sort of just a fascinating thing to us at GFI. So Varun talked about how the phone is a good 
technological precedent for what we're doing here. Apple created iPhone and then iPhone paid it back by making Apple one of the most valuable companies of our time. Are we going towards a similar direction with all protein where we create these super big, super important, super influential companies? And is there some fear to that? There is certainly some fear to that among some quarters for sure. It doesn't seem like it, right? I mean, um, there are now 60, I think, cultivated meat companies, um, just north of 20 of which have gotten some significant funding. All of the major meat companies have gotten involved in plant-based meat. And then there's also Impossible Foods, Beyond Meat, and a bunch of others. This definitely doesn't solve that problem. I don't think there's a way in which plant-based and cultivated meat attack the consolidation of agriculture and the agricultural conglomerate structure. Um, it solves a lot of problems. You know, it, uh, it helps to address climate change and a range of environmental issues. It helps to preserve working antibiotics. It helps to eliminate, well, maybe not eliminate, but pretty close um, food poisoning from contaminated meat. Um, it takes animals out of agriculture with all of the benefits to animal welfare involved in that and so on and so forth. Um, but it's not a panacea. It doesn't solve all of the world's problems or all of even the food industry's problems. What is really exciting about it also from a different standpoint is this is kind of like going back to the mobile phone analogy. It's kind of like going into the mobile phone industry where everyone kind of knows what the potential of it is going in. So they're all trying to get a piece of it. Right? And that includes the largest corporations, but it also includes startups that actually will have the ability to beat those large corporations. I mean, for all intents and purposes, even Impossible Foods and Beyond Meat that have raised hundreds of millions of dollars, one of whom has gone public, are startups, right? They're, they're tiny relative to the size of these other companies. They may be valued at a certain uh, amount that in some cases is even a multiple of these traditional meat companies, but that's because of the nature of innovation. Ramya, do you remember what, what the environment was like at the Future of Protein Summit? Okay, and I can tell you I've been to some other food industry summits more recently, and the vibe is dead. It's like Wall Street after 2008 happened, all right? And if you go to the Good Food Conference, it's like Wall Street in 2007 when the good times are still rolling, right? But, but that's the thing, right? When you make that analogy about good times versus bad times, you know, uh, one of my friends, I sent him one of the earliest articles we did about this sector. It was so new. Varun had just done a phenomenal interview with the Economic Times. We had just publicized our, you know, center of excellence in cellular agriculture that was planned with the ICT College in Mumbai. And the first thing he said to me was, this sounds like we are headed towards creating really dystopic and incredibly powerful conglomerates that would just control everything about how we eat and what we eat. Because to his mind, it was leading to a culture where it's only soy crops creating only a certain kind of plant-based or cultivated meat food. And that's all that's available because we're in some sort of endgame version of our world, which would happen if you only allowed the companies to dictate value chains and policy and everything else, which is not how it works, obviously. But how do you allay some of those fears about the fact that big business is going to control how we eat going forward? I mean, it's, I, guess, I guess the question is, to what degree does big business control the food we eat now? And why would this cause big business to have more control of the food we eat? I mean, it's certainly agriculture is consolidated, but there also is the capacity for variety. There's no reason that would be different in a scenario where plant-based and cultivated meat takes off. There would be a wider variety of cultivated meats, um, for sure. There would be a wider variety of the way that cultivated meat is constituted because there's really not the limit that exists across the limited number of species that we uh, raise for meat now. On the plant-based side, we've got, you know, we've got soy, we've got pea. Those are probably the two predominant plant-based proteins for plant-based meat at the moment. We'll certainly see lupin. We'll probably see lentils. We may see sorghum. We'll probably see a, a much wider variety. That will be very good for farmers. As this begins to really cut into industrial animal meat, we'll see less of the problems that come with especially agricultural consolidation of chicken farming and beef farming and pig farming. And that's going to be really good for workers and farmers. And at least in developed economies, probably the worst job in developed economies is working in abattoirs. 
So to see the um, capitalism shift people out of abattoirs and into factories that don't involve slaughtering live animals, like those jobs are going to be better. So, yeah, I mean, it doesn't get rid of and we don't want to get rid of uh, the really big food conglomerates uh, and the really big meat companies. But it does shift their production into something that solves some pretty big problems. I mean, I would think anybody who's thinking about the existential risk of climate change, anybody who's thinking about a world in which you scrape your knee and you have to amputate your leg because antibiotics no longer work, um, if we have a solution to those two problems or something that significantly alleviates the harm um, and makes it far more likely that we're going to preserve working antibiotics, uh, to come along and say, yes, but you're not also solving this other problem uh, seems to be pretty lacking in foresight unless you have a solution that does. If you have a solution that solves the antibiotics and the climate change issue and global malnutrition and that also moves us in toward a significantly less concentrated form of agriculture, you know, great, let's hear it. But nobody's even like spoken a sentence to me ever that indicates that they do have that solution. It's also really interesting. I I do think, as I was saying earlier, that smaller companies have the capacity to win in this industry, especially as we at the Good Food Institute and other organizations, like hopefully governments, continue to create open source information, universities, governments, etc. Open source information and talent pools that can allow someone to innovate really rapidly in this area and challenge these large companies, right? I, I read today that Tesla now is outselling all the German majors, right? That's an example of a company. Of course, they have massive resources, but but it's an example of a company that came in, essentially demonstrated the value of an industry that people had been talking about for a very long time. They demonstrated the financial value of that industry, pulled in a number of the large automakers, and they're still winning, even though those large automakers are in that industry now. Uh, I think it's a broader question about society and regulation when those same companies, Tesla, and then other tech companies like Google, Facebook, etc., become a certain size, how do governments regulate those companies, etc., without then shutting the door in the face of other new entrants, etc. But that that's a, as Bruce was saying, I think that's a very large question that doesn't actually address the fundamental underlying problem, which is, are we creating a new system that's better than, than the previous system? And in this case, vastly so. So that's the hope that we're trying to accelerate here. You know, we're recording this as the coronavirus, the novel coronavirus, which Varun mentioned earlier, COVID-19 as it's called, is causing a great degree of alarm about, you know, seems like we're headed towards a pandemic. Reports say 60% of the world's population could be at risk. Containment seems like it's no longer a real solution. So it started, as he said, at a seafood market where wildlife was sold in Wuhan. What if our timelines are completely skewed, for instance, Bruce? What if we're working on a solution that has all these capabilities to solve multiple problems at the same time, but the threats to that are progressing much faster? Well, I think that is actually the scenario that we're in. Um, but what's the, what's the alternative? Yes, I think we are already in a situation where the impact of climate change is being broadly felt globally. We do have 800 million people who are malnourished from their perspective. The emergency is now. Antibiotics are already starting to go obsolete. More and more antibiotics are not working. Um, more and more superbugs are figuring out how to get around the antibiotics that are designed to kill them. But that shouldn't mean, you know, it, it's useful, I suppose, to recognize where you are and the trajectory of all of these harms. But we should still do what we can to mitigate them. So climate is going to get worse and worse. And the solution is not to pump more and more CO2 and CO2 equivalents, methane and nitrous oxide and so on, into the atmosphere. That will make it even worse. Um, similarly with antibiotic resistance, yeah, lots of people are dying. Uh, do we want more people dying from antibiotic resistance or fewer people? Do we want climate change to get worse or to not get worse? And so on across these issues. I mean, from the perspective of animals and abattoirs, things are extraordinarily bad now. Do we say, gosh, things are extraordinarily bad. There's nothing we can do for the animals right now. Well, we can do something for animals later. We can mitigate climate change later. We can increase the likelihood that antibiotics don't go completely obsolete. We can create a food system that causes fewer people to be mal malnourished over time. Um, and we should. Okay, switching tack a little bit now. Bruce, you've seen entrepreneurs across the world. And uh, of course, context matters, but... Um, the could... Indian entrepreneurs are absolutely the best, Varun. <laughs> Thank you. That is the question I was going <laughs> to ask. That was the now, right answer. <laughs> that is, that's the right answer, but it's not they're actually... They're the smartest. They're the most attractive. There you go. 
All right. So what are some features aside from the, the smarts and attractiveness um, of entrepreneurs who succeed in this sector? Um, yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't think I'm uh, uniquely qualified to answer that question. And I don't think the answer to that question probably changes across any sector, really. Probably the most important thing is grit. Entrepreneurship is about failure and obstacle. I think probably every entrepreneur will tell you that you get a lot more bad news than you get good news. You have a lot more challenges than you have opportunities, unless you can literally turn those challenges up into opportunities. That feels a little bit like a uh, sort of <laughs> cliche that belongs on a greeting card or a bumper sticker or a t-shirt or something rather than reality. And I think the trick is just to uh, to really recognize that challenges are there to be learned from and overcome. And bad news is just something that happens on the way to good news. So I think with every entrepreneur, they have all kinds of stories about when they were getting started and when something looked like failure and ended up not being failure. And just the stories even in this sector that you get to learn if you're fairly deep into it about companies that have become wildly successful, uh, that looked very likely not to become wildly successful sort of multiple times are pretty fascinating. So I think the number one is is grit. Um, and then success in anything, uh, intelligence is going to be uh, pretty critically important. So how did you decide, Bruce, if I may, to appoint Varun as our India MD sometime in late 2017, was it? Yeah. And what made you think that this was the right time to get into this market? It seems very early days. I know when Varun first joined, he told us about how a lot of investors as well as companies thought it was too early to invest. And thankfully, we've been instrumental in changing their minds on this, thanks to the work we've done, thanks to the Future of Protein Summit and demonstrating the market pull does exist. But at that point, how did you sort of look into the future and say the time is now to be in India? Well, I think you have definitely proved them wrong and changed their minds. Um, I've talked to quite a few people who said that GFI India was instrumental in changing how they think about alt proteins in India specifically. And when GFI, when I was first putting our strategic plan together at the end of 2015, at that point, I saw India as one of the five additional regions that we would want to operate in. And that was because I was familiar with India's world-class universities, uh, with researchers in India in both plants um, and in tissue engineering, which are the formative scientific disciplines for plant-based and cultivated meat, was aware of India as a top global producer and a big part of GFI's theory of change is that it needs to happen in developing economies, not just developed economies. So we were open to being proven wrong, like we wanted to do scoping first. And our managing director, who we hired in the summer of 2016 for international engagement, had the opportunity to come to India and came to India to do essentially a scoping study and to interview people and talk with people and, and find out whether India was someplace that we needed to be. And she found Varun through Effective Altruism, uh, which is GFI was set up as an organization um, explicitly as an EA, as an Effective Altruism organization, and have done a lot with EA groups around the world. And she found Varun and chatted with him and said, hey, would you like to help us scope and perhaps launch GFI in India? And he said, I think I'll give you half of my time for this endeavor. And um, so Nicole reached out to me and said, uh, I know we have our retreat in like two weeks. I want to bring this guy who I met in Mumbai to our retreat in two weeks. And I said, you know, the more the merrier, which is my general theory of everything. Um, and Varun came to the retreat and just really wowed people with his thoughtfulness about this extraordinarily nascent industry and also with his ability to really think in EA terms, which GFI does, and to frame the how he was thinking about India on the basis of limited time with Nicole aligned perfectly with how we were thinking about international expansion. And so um, sort of lucked into him a little bit and have been just very enthusiastic about all he's been able to accomplish here. And vice versa. So the, the, the piece that you may not know actually was the first time I had even heard about GFI was a couple of months prior in August 2017 at the Effective Altruism Conference in San Francisco where I met Bruce and I met some of the other principal actors in the entire space. So some of the folks at Memphis Meets, etc. were at that conference. So it seemed to me to be pretty serendipitous that Nicole was visiting a couple of months later and I had spent a lot of time reading about it in, in the in intervening period. One thing though in the question that I do want to push back on is I think 
many people before they ate these burgers in the US would not have told you that what they wanted was a plant-based burger that bleeds, right? Or something that tastes exactly like meat but isn't made from meat. So oftentimes people will say something is early until they see the first iteration of it and then they kind of get it. So Bruce referred earlier to Beyond Meat's chicken strips that Ethan Brown is now embarrassed about. When Bill Gates ate those chicken strips, he wrote a blog that, and he said that what I just ate is not a clever meat substitute. It is the future of food. So it's just one of those things that, you know, Ford famously said, if I had asked people what they want, they would have asked for a faster horse and carriage. This is just one of those things where if you can invent the future, that's probably the fastest way to figuring out if people want it or not. Yeah, and that, I think that also underlines, I, I get a question about whether uh, GFI in the United States launching in early 2016, like, was that the perfect time to launch? And I think the U.S. would have been ready for it in 2000. I mean, the U.S. would have been ready for it in the mid-1990s. It really took Ethan Brown and Pat Brown, I think independently, coming up with the idea of focusing their products on literally everybody and not just on vegetarians and reducitarians. That's the thing that inspired me to start the Good Food Institute. And I'm not sure it was a, you know, an idea whose time had come. I think it could have come decades earlier. And I think probably India would have been ripe for these ideas earlier as well. But this is just, you know, when we launched and, and sure enough, it's ready now. So Bruce, you mentioned a number of other countries where we're already operating, right? Some of those countries, Israel, Singapore, even Canada, we don't have an office there, but these countries have actually taken quite strident steps in the direction of investing in alternative protein. Could you talk a little bit about how regulatory ecosystems and then also government investment in these countries actually creates pull for other countries to come into the space as well? Yeah, I mean, our hope is that this will create a sense of competition among countries. But yeah, Canada is putting a lot of money into pulses. Remains to be seen how much of that is going to be plant-based meat specifically, but it certainly is uh, extraordinarily helpful to what it is that we're trying to accomplish with plant-based meat. Singapore is putting a lot of money into both plant-based and cultivated meat. And that signaling, especially from forward-thinking countries like Israel and Singapore, hopefully will inspire countries like the United States and China and others to put more and more money into these sorts of innovations. It just says, you know, hey, this is possible. Hey, this is something that countries we admire are doing. Um, and it certainly makes our job at GFI easier as we go into Europe and the United States and India and every place else and say, you know, these are problems that you recognize that you have. Innovating in meat can be a part of solving those problems. And here's what that would look like. It really is something of a, a space race uh, with different countries that that will probably be have bragging rights for the rest of eternity, as Bruce says, if they're able to invest in this area and really carve out a, a position of primacy very early on. You know, Bruce, um, as a sector that's trying to create an Indian beyond or impossible, our problems are very unique, as you very well know. Consumers are a bit of a dark area for us in terms of what their preferences in this sector might be. We have um, issues of employment and displacement, as well as socioeconomic factors about meat. You know, the very framing of meat is such that you have to approach it very delicately in terms of how are you replicating meat and for what communities and what does that mean for them in our culture. So as we try to build a homegrown beyond or impossible in India, what would your advice to us be? What should we be mindful of? And where are the gaps in terms of what it will take to build that company? And this is like the, the question that you started off with. And I'm like, Ramya, <laughs> <laughs> how am I going to answer this question for, for you and Varun? But um, I mean, I think, again, this is probably somewhat, well, no, I think India is unique. So it's probably not universal to say that really figuring out the ecosystem as much as possible before going, not being afraid to try things and fail, while simultaneously recognizing that MVP, like there's a, a concept MVP, minimum viable product, that is super famous in Silicon Valley. And it says, put your thing into the world and start with your sort of early customers to figure it out, reform it and make it better. I don't think that sort of iterative process works with food. Um, I mean, it worked a little bit with Beyond Meat, as, as Varun was just nodding at. Uh, but it's worth mentioning that the chicken strips that Ethan is embarrassed about now were sold at Whole Foods for a couple of weeks as chicken, and nobody noticed or complained. Similarly, Mark Bittman, who is 
like a very um, well-respected cookbook author and food columnist who has written a bunch of meat-focused and chicken-focused cookbooks. He said he couldn't tell the difference. So the new product, I'm sure, is even better, but it was pretty good. Similarly, Impossible 1.0 and the Beyond Burger 1.0 were fantastic products. They're even better now, but they launched with fantastic products. So launching with a crappy product is probably a bad idea everywhere. Beyond that, I I think just recognizing the complexity of your ecosystem and not trying to make it seem less complex than it is, not assuming that you have all the answers and really trying to figure things out, going in with a listening ear rather than sort of an answering voice is probably good advice for, for innovators everywhere. So Bruce, as we're on this path, on this space race of sorts, and companies like Tyson, Cargill, Nestle as well are getting involved, the largest companies in the world and the entrepreneurs in the sector that are really at the forefront, at the vanguard, impossible foods, beyond meat, just these companies are scaling really rapidly. What are the signposts that let us know that the theory of change is playing out as intended? How do we know alt protein is winning? And I think we've seen the signposts so far. This is something that you you, uh, mentioned earlier, just what a banner year 2019 was for alt protein. Um, Definitely the idea of an impossible Whopper um, or the rebel Whopper in Brazil and Europe was something I would not have expected to happen this quickly, but it's certainly a a very clear signpost. We need to make sure that it doesn't, you know, vanish in the next year or two. I don't think that would be uh, an insurmountable obstacle if that happened, but assuming that it continues to be as wildly successful as it's been so far, that is just a beyond phenomenal sign. The IPO of Beyond Meat, which also happened, I think, more quickly than I would have expected. Impossible Foods raising almost a billion dollars at this point, roughly $800 million dollars the Memphis meets Series B. So the smaller startups, seeing more of them raise Series A and B and C rounds um, or be acquired by major food companies, I think is uh, an extraordinarily good sign. And then seeing companies like Tyson and Smithfield and Cargill and Purdue launching either uh, hybrid products or full out plant-based meat products, also just a phenomenal, phenomenal sign. Um, and assuming that uh, that all of these companies continue to sell these products and the products continue to do well, um, I'd say we're we're well on well on the road. I guess prices coming down and the products actually succeeding in taste tests would also be, I think, essential to the success of, of these technologies. So, Bruce, um, you know, I know you're probably going to lob this back at me as why are you asking me this question, Ramya? You should know better. But the work we're doing here. You know, the IPCC has framed the climate change in the context that, you know, disenfranchised and vulnerable communities get affected most. The answers we are finding in India are going to probably have answers for a lot of the problems framed in those sort of base of pyramid or bottom of pyramid solutions. How do you see the work that we're doing in India sort of fitting into your global strategy? Or what would it prove to you if we could manage to crack this fairly complex solution in India? And what would that look like to you? Well, I think it doesn't look significantly different in India from what it looks like anyplace else. India is number one in global pulses, obviously, and producing pulses globally. Uh, India has world-class universities and plant biologists, scientists in plant biology and tissue engineering. And India is a really great place to do manufacturing. So across the sort of... uh, pulse optimization. It seems like India would be a great place for that to be happening um, in terms of manufacturing and in terms of the science. So India has sort of all of the raw materials to be on the front lines of plant-based and cultivated meat R&D. And the inroads that GFI India is making with the government of Maharashtra, um, as well as the, the national government in India, certainly points toward India being on the forefront from a regulatory standpoint and also from a government funding standpoint. We've already seen a lot of this happening across India. So it's extraordinarily complex and we don't want to get too far out in front of ourselves, but everything we're seeing from GFI India and the ecosystem in India so far is making us very optimistic um, about the global ecosystem for alternative proteins. All right. And this is a question that we like to ask all of our guests. What does 2050 look like for Bruce? What does an average day in 2050 look like for Bruce Friedrich? An average day in 2050. I mean, it's uh, <laughs> you'd ask me 20 years ago when an average day uh, in uh, 2020 was going to look like I would have come nowhere near 
uh, what I'm doing now. So it's really, t- it's really, it's tough to say. I mean, so the sort of, I mean, it's not high risk, high reward exactly, but like the thing I am most optimistic about that GFI does is encouraging governments to put money into plant-based and cultivated meat. As I mentioned earlier, governments are putting roughly a hundred billion dollars per year into initiatives that help the medical sectors in their domestic economies. Governments are putting tens of billions of dollars into renewable energy. If governments choose to put tens of billions of dollars a year, and that's just into the research and development, um, if they also subsidize the industry and really recognize the tremendous opportunity across a range of borderline existential or even existential threats that alternative proteins represents, if governments really take that seriously, they could knock out the whole plant-based and cultivated meat thing um, in fairly short order. In which case, I'd be looking for another area that is extraordinarily high impact, that is tractable, and that is neglected uh, to focus my time and attention on. Because alternative proteins, it doesn't, you know, as we were talking about earlier, it doesn't solve all of the world's problems. There's still going to be poverty. There's still going to be animal suffering. There's still going to be global health concerns. And I will attempt probably, you know, working with the Center for Effective Altruism in 80,000 hours uh, to figure out where my time could be best spent and go there. My hunch is that come 2050, we will not have solved the alt protein problem, but we'll see. It's just really, uh, it's tough to predict. It could happen very, very quickly or it might not. If it hasn't, I imagine I will. I will still be doing something in this sector, uh, maybe running the Good Food Institute. Bruce, thank you for being on Feeding 10 Billion. Thanks so much for having me, Varun and Ramya. It's really a pleasure. I love this podcast. On the second season of Feeding 10 Billion, we're diving even deeper. We've covered broad perspectives on plant-based meat and cultivated meat, thought through the considerations for their growth in emerging markets like India, and featured some of the most exciting entrepreneurs and celebrated investors in the space. Since then, the GFI India team has also grown, and through the work of our team and the stakeholders in our ecosystem, the sector has taken some major leaps forward in the country. It's starting to look like the early-stage ecosystem in the United States did, when GFI US was officially established in 2016. But of course, smart protein won't tread the same paths in India that it did in the US. There are important infrastructure, investment, government and talent pool differences. We think that for all these differences, what can emerge in the developing world is even more meaningful. A supply of affordable, sustainable, delicious protein foods that take us from scarcity to abundance. If you want to start a company in this space or are interested in just learning more about this sector, maybe you're a researcher, maybe you want to collaborate, please do reach out. You can also join our GF Ideas India Smart Protein Innovation Community on LinkedIn or follow us on social media. We are at Good Food India on Twitter and the Good Food Institute India on Instagram. And we leave our LinkedIn URL in our description. If you like this podcast, don't forget to check out other interesting podcasts on the IVM network. You can listen to us on the IVM Podcast app or ivmpodcasts.com. You can also follow us on our social media. We are at IVM Podcasts on Twitter and Instagram. And if you want to reach out to me, I am at Varun D7 on Twitter and at Varun5 on Instagram. You can come ask me why. And if you want to reach out to me, I'm Cryptic Caprice on Twitter and Dithering Funambulist on Instagram. Please don't ask me why. We look forward to having you with us every week. And of course, if you'd like to be part of accelerating the future of our food system, please just get in touch. You can email us at india at gfi.org. My name is Varun Deshpande, Managing Director at the Good Food Institute India. And I'm Ramya Ramurthy, the Communications Specialist at the Good Food Institute India. And you have been a part of Feeding 10 Billion Season 2. Advertising is dead. Yep, you heard me right. Advertising is dead. We're all in the content business now. Let's not call it news, TV, radio, etc, etc. It's all content and we're in the middle of this weirdly exciting phase where all the borders and lines that have been drawn over decades has been swept away by this lovely thing called the internet. We're a show where we don't dwell on just the stuff that is now, but rather the wider stuff about advertising, media, content and the whole goddamn circus surrounding it. Tune in every Tuesday for our weekly unboxing of the mystery box we used to call advertising. I'm Varun Dugirala, co-founder and content chief at The Glitch, and this is my new podcast, Advertising is Dead. Namaskar, this is Ashish Vidyarthi. Yes, my friend, these are challenging times, but in these challenging times, we can create something extraordinary. 
Do take time to listen to my podcast, Begin the Journey. Available on the IVM Podcast, website, app, or wherever you listen to podcasts. Remember, we have a great opportunity called life. Cheers. Cheers.